and involved very heavily with regard to the American Academy of Pediatrics. So, but more importantly than that, that when we're talking about world food issues, in fact, it turns out that she's going to be discussing with us tonight work that demonstrates that this isn't just a problem of obesity, of too much to eat. It's a problem uh, that involves micronutrients and involves a remarkable series of events that can happen within the exact same family. So we're talking about things that occur in many, the entire development process different than we expected. So we have an opportunity to learn at the cutting edge of the newest ideas and, and the, one of the best summaries of this that we can possibly get anywhere, any place right now. So we're very fortunate uh, to, to have her with us tonight. And she is um, uh, a tremendous dynamo person uh, to work with. And she and she goes, she is, uh, I hope, it's appropriate to say you're a nominee, is that okay. She's a nominee for the presidency of the American Academy of Pediatrics and is going to be giving a special kickoff for that this week on Thursday night. So she has to be exiting on Thursday afternoon, so I want you to be aware that we're fortunate that she's scheduled early in the program for us so that we can have time. She can have relaxed time with us this week to uh, get to know who we are and help contribute to the efforts that we're all working with uh, this week. So with that in mind, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, uh, Professor Hassing, who is talking about, as you can see here, the global problem of the double burden of obesity and undernutrition. Thank you. amazing convergence of your work and um, some of the very early thinking among the obesity <coughs> folks of, about um, obesity as malnutrition and the convergence of obesity and undernutrition in the work, in, in all of our work. Just by way of um, background, I started our obesity clinic at Memorial Day, I did 26 years ago. At that point, obesity was not on the radar screen. Uh, anybody's radar screen, and I was actually seeing mostly adolescents. Uh, I was being laughed at actually because people didn't understand why I, a pediatrician, a medical doctor, would be interested in obesity. And um, it was seen at that time, and still a little bit at this time, as sort of a moral failing. If only kids and parents would do the right thing, we wouldn't have obesity. And I'm not going to go into what we've learned about obesity in 26 years in this talk. But only to say, for example, we now have young adults coming to liver transplant solely based on the liver disease that you get from obesity. We have um, two-year-olds that you can see evidence of this liver disease starting. We have um, eight-year-olds who have type 2 diabetes. We have five-year-olds with high cholesterol. So what we've seen across this epidemic level of obesity is the um, migration of adult diseases down into early as childhood and now I see they before a week. So um, it's, it's an epidemic and uh, we can talk a lot about the seriousness and the burden that it's placing on our, our now two generations of children and the economic uh, system and our healthcare system. But today I want to talk, I want to talk about something um, that I think is very important because I think we will now be seeing the convergence of, of, some, of things that we might have thought were separate. Um, so underweight and obesity are actually among the top 10 leading risk factors for the global burden of disease. And that's rather astounding because in the past, infectious disease accounted for most of that burden. Um, but we think now we have nutritional diseases, nutritional conditions that are really heading the list for the disease risk, not just in our country, in the developed world, uh, and, and, um, but in, in globally. And so you know that obesity is excess calories and a positive energy balance at its basis. Um, and it's a major risk factor for non-communicable diseases, diabetes and cardiovascular disease being uh, the two uh, that account for two-thirds of global mortality. This is a really unique situation that we haven't encountered before. And when you think about seeing children with obesity, we've never seen 100 pounds three olds you know, we've never seen 250-pound 8-year-olds. We've rarely seen 450-pound 
16 year olds, and those are the extremes. So not only do we have a burden across the entire population of overweight, we're seeing extremes of obesity we've never seen. Now you're all familiar with undernutrition. We're going to be talking today about stunting, which is decreased height for age and wasting which is uh, that significantly decreased weight for height. And some of that was deficiencies of essential vitamins and minerals. And we know that when you're undernourished, you're increasingly susceptible to infectious disease. Infectious disease also take, takes a, a toll nutritionally, but you're also susceptible for cognitive impairment of your child. And um, you'll see that when we talk about this, that you're susceptible for later risk of obesity and non -tunic. So we've seen, um, we, we've been thinking about obesity and undernutrition as separate and even sometimes opposing entities. So at least, at least in this country, the hunger community and the obesity community have not converged and are working on a population which often has both of these um, conditions embedded in it. Um, these obesity and undernutrition coexist globally, as you're well aware, nationally, locally, within families, and even within individuals. So we have this convergence that we'll be talking about. Um, so the double burden that we're talking about today of under and over nutrition occurring simultaneously within a population is, is really um, a new an entity that we need to be thinking about. I wanted to just uh, point you to this slide, which is an overview of nutrition transition and its health implications. And you can see that there's demographic transitions from uh, societies with high fertility and high mortality. Um, as the mortality uh, is reduced, um, fertility is, is uh, reduced, uh, increased uh, older population. Um, epidemiologic transitions go from a high prevalence of infectious disease as you control the sanitation and the infection control you begin to, um, and focus on famine alleviation, you begin to see the emergence of chronic diseases, and you go from a high prevalence of undernutrition, famine receives, um, you then go quickly, developing countries are going much more quickly into obesity from undernutrition, more quick at faster rates than are in the developed countries, and you see the emergence of chronic non-communicable diseases. And there on the bottom gives us a hint um, how we might be coping with this, and um, how are we going to focus on this dual burden, how are we going to focus on both our interventions to prevent it, and uh, the policy and initiatives that we need to, to address it. So an example of uh, an epidemiologic transition in developing countries would be urbanization, so increasing uh, with look at the physical activity decreases, all the labor-saving devices work, the cars, the phone lines, the TVs and appliances, um, improved health and nutrition in women and children, redu reduction in diarrheal diseases, sanitary food control, um, increased income and food supplementation programs. So in Chile, when they underwent their uh, transition from uh, high malnutrition to obesity, um, they were giving poor families um, about 200 uh, to 600 calories more per person than they actually needed. And that actually accelerated the transition as they did all these other things. So you can see that some of the interventions for undernutrition in the right settings actually, uh, if not carefully done, are compelling the transition into obesity. So this is the prevalence of obesity globally, and you can see the dark red um, is over 30%. So we are certainly in this country uh, affected by that. But look at some of the other countries that are affected by very high rates of obesity in North Africa and South Africa. And then 20 to 29 percent are the golden colors. Um, much of um, the, uh, Russia and um, Australia and some of South America, and then 10 to 20 percent in the tan, and then less than 10 percent in the pale colors. So clearly, this is a global epidemic, and in fact, the World Health Organization declared obesity in, as a global health epidemic. But then you see malnutrition. And so while not overlap, we, see, we clearly see we have a coexistence, at least globally, of obesity and malnutrition, and the darkest red are the 35% of a population that's undernourished, and you, undernourished, and you can see that in sub-Saharan Africa, um, 20 to 34%, most of Africa, 5 to 20%, um, you can see um, yes, Asia. So you can see the hotspots still that exist, and even though strides have been made in malnutrition, they're still incredible burden of disease. So I made this slide just to begin uh, uh, our thinking about what is the nutritional landscape that we're seeing. 
Um, we're seeing, of course, both obesity and undernutrition and stunting. We're seeing a misaligned food supply with inadequate dietary uh, nutritional access and poor quality. <coughs> and, and we're seeing hunger and food insecurity. So um, I see children with obesity, hunger is an incredibly frequent complaint in that population, especially in the under five. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about why. Um, and we see at the uh, micronutrient deficiencies coexist in both populations of under and overnutrition. And then I think at the bottom, the lack of healthy lifestyle skills, and you heard Saul talking this morning about cooking. I will tell you that uh, very few people that I see cook. Um, when you're trying to advocate for a healthy diet, it is incredibly difficult to do that when nobody knows how to prepare a meal. We've taught cooking classes. Um, one of my mothers said, was very proud, she said, I cooked tonight, and I said, this is great, what did you cook? She said, I bought a bag of lettuce, and I bought the chicken strips, and I put the chicken strips on the lettuce. That's an advance. Okay, that's meal assembly, right? It gets you one step closer to cooking. Uh, we uh, taught pre-diabetic adolescents to cook. Um, there are no measuring cups in any of these households. There are no tablespoons. There's no knowledge of how to put together a meal, and even um, what constitutes a healthy meal. So the lack of essential skills, and I, I was so touched by what Saul said, because these cultural skills that have been handed down and handed down, skills for meal preparation, even parenting skills around food and uh, making routines for your day and little children, um, but somehow the, the bottom has dropped out of the transmission of these skills in, 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 our, in our culture. Um, I wanted to focus, I'm a pediatrician, so I'm, I'm very focused on the maternal child diet, and I wanted to start uh, focusing about maternal undernutrition. And this is an, an enormous problem, the enormity of which I think we're just beginning to recognize in terms of its repercussions. But um, you can see there that um, Bangladesh has higher uh, maternal undernutrition than any other developing country. And uh, over a third of their uh, childbearing, uh, women of childbearing age have chronic energy deficiency. And as the mother goes, so goes the child. You can't have a well nourished child, an infant that is not, um, doesn't have injury or birth retardation if you have a malnourished mother. Um, it, it moved. In Pakistan, the prevalence of malnutrition and lactating in pregnant women is high, higher than their non pregnant counterpart, which is, is quite interesting. And in Indonesia, um, uh, a high percentage of women um, who are malnourished and uh, almost half of pregnant women are pregnant. So we have an incredible burden of women in chi of childbearing age, pregnant women and women who uh, are lactating. Um, in South Asia, maternal malnutrition is responsible for up to half of intrauterine growth restriction. And um, babies who are born with intrauterine growth restriction actually have if they're born into a setting where nutrition later becomes available, they have high rates of obesity and later chronic disease, diabetes, and uh, cardiovascular disease. And this work was really kicked off by David Parker, and you may be all familiar with his work, when he looked at middle-aged adults in England and found that um, the higher propensity of cardiovascular disease and diabetes and, and uh, central adiposity was in the adults that were small at birth. So being small at birth, and he, it took him probably a decade to get this work published because nobody would believe that something happened at birth could affect your health and his life. And um, he, that started the whole field of thinking about intrauterine programming. And now that we know about epigenetics, we'll talk about that in a while, how you can be programmed intrauterine to, to actually change gene expression and then fall into a nutritional um, environment that actually uh, supply was not restricted and developed these diseases in middle age. And then you see Sub Saharan Africa, only three out of ten countries um, have um, shown a decline in maternal malnutrition. And so um, the burden of all that malnutrition you see is falling on the mother. Um, why? And, and so this brings up the point we talked about today about the women and what's happening to the women. And so um, in developing countries, women usually fall behind the men in their access to food, health care, and education. And I think we've all seen this. And so there's illiteracy, poverty, and lack of employment. And then the finer factors, education, exposure to media, and, and uh, domestic decision making um, that uh, is skewed away from the women. 
Um, and women with low status in societies have weaker control over house, the household resources, tighter time constraints because of uh, physical labor, less access to information and health services, often poor mental health and lower self-esteem. So these factors are not conducive to, to climbing your way out of uh, the, the, the situation if you're undernourished and you're trying to access resources and you're trying to gather um, uh, food for your family and you're trying to cook that food uh, in, in this situation. Additional stressors on, on uh, maternal mothers and, and women with our food insecurity. We'll talk about that. Inadequate diets, recurrent infections, poor health care, heavy work burdens, and gender inequalities. So the very um, dyad that we uh, societies have traditionally needed to protect, protect for the future of the mother and the diet is under incredible stress. So we have under, intertwined under nutrition and obesity. So a, a mother who's undernourished in pre-pregnancy, during pregnancy, and uh, will have a child that's uh, small, uh, undernourished with some micronutrient deficits program, possibly for later obesity, and um, at greater risk or developing non-communicable disease. So in this country, we worry about the moms who have obesity and diabetes, and their intrauterine environment predisposes the child to have higher rates of obesity and diabetes, and so we're very worried about this generational progression. But we need to also be worried about the mothers in the developing world who the other end of the U-shaped curve, the small babies, are also at risk for later obesity and non communicable so more than a third of all under five child deaths um, are due to malnutrition, and we're going to focus on the under five population today, and this represents 11% of the global burden. So we're losing our youngest children. Um, the global prevalence of underweight has declined. The average rate of reduction is about 2%. This is not going to be fast enough to meet the, the, the World Health Organization goal. It's declining, but not fast enough. And you see here underweight, again, this is under five-year-olds. So the purple is over a third of under five-year-olds underweight. Again, you see Sub-Saharan Africa, India, and Pakistan, and Bangladesh. Um, you have Africa, again, uh, goes from 10 to 30 percent, and um, less than 10 percent in the more developed worlds. But these are our, our under five-year-olds, and they're the most susceptible to, to the diarrheal diseases and infectious diseases. So you can see the progression of the higher income and upper middle income countries on the very bottom of this graph have, have low rates of underweight. Um, and the low income and lower middle income have reduced the rates, but not, we don't have parity. And there's some stalling out of that rate reduction at the present. Wasting is low weight for height, um, significantly low weight for height. This um, has decreased. Um, but 70% of the world's children with wasting live in Asia, and most in South Central Asia, where 25 million children are affected. So even though the numbers are going down, this represents an incredible uh, number of the population affected. And you can see wasting, this is severe um, malnutrition, and you can see the concentrations there in the dark red over 50%. Now, stunting has also decreased, and this is low height for weight. The number of stunting under five in the world has declined from 253 million to 165 million, still an incredible burden. Um, and stunting is very interesting. Stunting is it's kind of a cumulative record of the past and present growth restrictions affecting the child's life. So stunting occurs in a situation of inadequate nutrition compounded with frequent infection. In settings, socioecological settings of household food insecurity, inadequate health care, poor sanitation, and lack of access to health services. Mm -hmm. So stunting is sort of a sociologic record that the child bears in their body. Um, and you can see that the, the, there's political contextual factors here, poverty, unemployment, lim limited access to capital, and it's the most prevalent form of undernutrition worldwide. And we see stunting in this country, and we see it from our children that come up from Mexico and South America, who are short for their, um, they have low height for age. And they sort of bear that record of generationally and what they've been through in this country. And there's some who are 
that shows in some of our lower, lowest socioeconomic populations in this country, there's still, still some stunting. And it's not well worked out in this country because we're not looking for it as aggressively as, as we look for it in the developing world. But the prevalence among children less than five of stunting was 38% in Africa, that's 60 million children. It's a lower percentage in Asia, but more children, 100 million children, and in Latin America, 13%. And this takes place very early in childhood. This takes place soon after, um, soon after birth, and it reaches its lowest value at two years of age. So stunting takes place very early, and once you're stunted, you don't recover that time. So the intrauterine period and the first two years of postnatal life are crucial for preventing the stunting and malnutrition that sets you up for later obesity and chronic non-communicable diseases in the environments that developing countries are transitioning into food life. Um, consequences of stunting alone, 15% of deaths in children are due to, uh, related to stunting, um, and nutrition infection interactions are the risk here for this book, these young children. Um, maybe as much to the point as death is the morbidity, so stunting is associated with impaired cognitive de development. And this is coupled, you have a child who has risk for impaired cognitive development, and in a deprived environment. So what you get is lower school performance, poor attention in class, greater grade repetition, higher dropout of school over graduation. <coughs> so the very population you're trying to advance is emerging, starting with a burden that impedes that advancement. And maternal stunting and intrauterine drug retardation or restriction on risk for obesity. And this is stunting, again, percent is in the dark of children who are stunted in the same kind of regions, a little bit in Central America and South America. And again, you see this upper and high income countries have, have reduced the rates and the upper middle income rates have gone down, but the low, uh, uh, least developed countries are having trouble uh, wrestling their rates with the ground. So the reduction, the goals that we have for reducing underweight and reducing stunting um, are, are stagnant. And we can think about why that may be, but we're not we're not getting there as fast as we wanted to. So what's happening in our the population shift? If we step back and say what's happening when we try we're trying to shift from a high prevalence of infectious disease, malnutrition, and periodic famine, and poor sanitation, we're trying to shift that curve, and we're, we're shifting right into chronic and degenerative disease and obesity. So if we look at type 2 diabetes, which is the epidemic behind the obesity epidemic, so we have the obesity epidemic and then we have the chronic disease epidemic following it, um, the lowest rates of diabetes are in populations with traditional lifestyles. Um, we have a 7% prevalence or slightly higher in adults here, but the urbanized Fiji Islanders who went from their traditional lifestyle right into an urbanized lifestyle have a 23% rate of diabetes, and you heard about the Pima Indians who had the same kind of rapid transition. Um, the largest increases in type 2 are in populations which have gone the most rapid change, developing to sort of a westernized diet. And think about type 2 diabetes. Type 2 diabetes is kind of a nasty disease. You start out on oral medication, it's not that cheap. You can move quickly to insulin, you need injections, you need insulin pumps, you need eye care, you need wound care, you need foot care. It's a, it's a, it's a highly costly disease in the countries that are least prepared to deal with the cost of this disease. And so we look at this kind of transition, and this is under five-year-olds overweight. Okay, so we just looked at under five-year-olds, they're, they're under nutrition, now we look at their overweight. And um, we're seeing slightly different pattern of overweight. Some of the, the North African countries and some of the caucuses um, we, we are still having the epidemic fueled in these very young children. So we have both underweight children at risk for later obesity and overweight, and overweight children already at risk for later communicable diseases. So we run a bariatric surgery program at the hospital where I work, and every adolescent, and it's not many adolescents, um, it's a tool, not a cure, but um, every adolescent that's come to surgery has been obese by the age of five. So once you're obese by the age of five, it's hard to recover. And the longer into childhood you go with obesity, the harder it is to recover that. And so we see the escalating rates, again, most in the developing world, but also in the, uh, most in the developed world, but also in the developing world. 
So David Ludwig would say that the obesity trajectory has four phases. The first phase is a steady increase in childhood obesity, and I think we're seeing that. There's some indication we may be leveling off, but right now 30% of children in this country have overweight or obesity. 60% of adults have overweight or obesity. Um, phase two would be the emergence of serious obesity-related comorbidities, and we're certainly seeing that in childhood and in adulthood. Phase three is medical complications leading to life-threatening disease and death in middle age. So if you have diabetes, type 2 diabetes at 8, which we have seen, there's a 20-year trajectory until you have end organ failure if you're not taking care of that. So now we have young adults, middle-aged adults, having the end organ failure of diabetes, renal disease, ocular disease, cardiovascular disease. And then phase four, acceleration of the obesity epidemic by transgenerational tr transmission, which means these small babies and these large babies who have altered intrauterine environments are emerging at greater risk of obesity. So this is just a cartoon of, of uh, uh, kind of a funny cartoon of epigenetics, where we've, we've known from animal studies that if you modulate um, uh, intake and the and, and, uh, methyl group um, a dietary intake in animals, you can influence methylation on the DNA and histone acetylation. And when the DNA gets methylated or acetylated, that gene readout is changed. And it can be changed for your entire life and the life of your children. So the environment, as we eat our environment, as we ingest the environment, and we and these changes occur, they are not re, they are not so far uh, found to be so easily reversible. They stay with us. They program us for later disease and our children are at future risk. So we're, we have a much more highly dynamic interaction with us in the genome and our environment than we ever really realized. And so there's a classic twin study where they studied three twins from three years old to 78, and they found that the methylation patterns in the three-year-olds were pretty similar, almost identical. These were identical twins. The 78-year-olds who had their own lives and, 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 and done their own thing had methylation patterns that were as different from each other as two unrelated individuals. So methylation is the read of your, your trajectory through the environment. So this is the theory called the developmental origins of health and disease, what affects us early in terms of our intrauterine and early infancy programs us for the rest of our life. So fetal and infant nutrition, infection, and other epigenetic factors. There's some fascinating animal studies that show that uh, rat mothers who don't pay attention to the, who neglect the rat pups. The rat pups have different methylation patterns, uh, different methylation patterns on their DNA than pups who were not neglected. So we are thinking that the whole work on um, child adverse childhood events and toxic stress and later disease is mediated through some of these epigenetic mechanisms. So we have short-term effects on brain and growth and metabolic programming and long-term effects on chronic disease education and um, and uh, uh, stunting and lower income. So these early effects are very important. And this is why this maternal infant dyad and these under five children are so critical to think about. So I wanted to just show some United States data. And so we know that we have obesity prevalence, and these are two to four year olds, and it's very interesting. It's local. So although you see the big maps with the southeastern states with high rates of obesity, when you boil this down to county level data, you see coexisting high obesity rates next to normal weight counties and higher prevalence of obesity sitting next to normal weight and sometimes underweight. So it's a, it's a very, it can be a very local phenomenon. This is a map just highlighting and reminding us to think about food insecurity. So the darkest states where, where we do have higher prevalence of obesity also have high prevalence of food insecurity. And the food insecurity questions you ask are, have you ever worried about running out of food in the last month? Um, and, have, and have you been um, afraid that you would not be able to feed your family? And they map pretty well to people being afraid that by the end of the month, or at some time in that last period, they will not be able to feed their families. And if ever you have looked into food pantries, what do you see in food pantries? You don't usually see a lot of fresh fruits and vegetables. You see a lot of processed foods, canned foods because that's what's stable. So when you can't feed your family and you go to other food sources, they, you're not eating the most healthy food. There are uh, nutritional risks in the overweight population. And we used to think, um, when I started, oh, they're overweight. They're, they're well-nourished. They're not well-nourished. They're poorly-nourished. 
often. And uh, this is the prevalence of iron deficiency within the, uh, this is an old slide, so at risk for overweight would be overweight, and overweight in the dark would be overweight. So these kids actually are, are having a higher prevalence of iron deficiency, and when you look at the World Bank, and you see how they look at nutritional markers of, of developing and, and mid-developed and developed countries, iron deficiency is one of those markers, and we're sliding a little backwards in our country. Uh, on, the, on that nutritional marker. So if we think what, what's happened, and we've talked a lot about what's happened, it's not that obesity has never been in, in the world. Obesity has been in the world, but in very small amounts. So obesity uh, correlates to our ability to survive <coughs> famine. So the people that could uh, most uh, efficiently manage their energy and make the most of their calories and uh, survive the cycles of famine. And obesity in many cultures was a sign of wealth so that it was promoted as a sign of plenty you had enough food. What we have now, though, is an epidemic of obesity, and we have the skewing of the population and the disease burden. But where we came from may have been hunter-gatherers, where we had diet high in carbs and fiber, and low in fat, and high in physical activity. So, uh, and then you see that there, as cycles of famine develop, diet becomes much less varied. And then there are large variations in availability, and so there's acute food scarcity, and then there's availability, and um, but availability to only a few, and physical activity may be made high because of the labor demands, and this is where stunting can occur. And then you see these stages, receding famine, degenerative disease, and behavioral change. And so receding famine is where um, we begin to, the diet begins to um, uh, emerge again, we have enough food, um, we then move into too much, maybe the wrong kind of food, and we go into the obesity degenerative disease. And so um, Barry Popkin would say maybe there's a stage five, and maybe that's behavioral change, where we are now, as we are here, consciously trying to eat a healthy diet and replace sedentarianism with physical activity and reduce uh, and improve health. Now, I'm not sure that behavior alone is going to get us where we need to go, at least in I think individually initiated behavior will get us somewhere, but I'm not sure that that's going to be enough to tackle what we need to tackle, and that we don't, we need to tackle on a policy level um, uh, arena. So these are some real cases because this is not a problem of these five categories being totally separate. There, there's a lot of mixed cases. So in India and the Philippines, you have a high prevalence of undernutrition in adults and children with high rates of micronutrient deficiencies coupled with the emergency, emergence of overnutrition, especially in urban adults. So in India, almost a quarter of the women of childbearing age already uh, have a high body mass index. In Delhi, more than 40% uh, of them. And obesity rates in the highest socioeconomic classes are half of the women and about a third of the men. So here they have uh, a mixed case where you have still the undernutrition in adults and children, but a group of adults becoming more obese. In South Africa, there's significant stunting, underweight's declining, but they have continued infectious disease, TB and HIV, and a high prevalence of micronutrient deficiencies, and then emergence again of the uh, overweight and obesity in adulthood. And it's interesting, I don't know if you picked it up on one of those uh, global graphs, uh, there was no data for South Africa on some of the stunting and wasting, so I think we don't really know exactly what's happening there. China, Egypt, and Mexico, have both stunting and overweight in children, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So this is where you have both conditions occurring in the same child. Um, high rates of obesity in adults with the chronic diseases, and micronutrient deficiencies prevalent across the board, particularly iron and vitamin A deficiencies. In anemia, uh, anemia um, in women of childbearing age and in children is very high, as it is in India. And so iron deficiency impairs cognitive development in a child. So you have a mother who's iron deficient. The baby is born with lack of iron stores. She's trying to lactate. No iron. The baby uh, weans. Not enough iron. And if there's a direct link to cognitive impairment there. Um, Mexico, again, and Philippines, high rates of anemia in pregnant women and young children. In the Philippines, there's been more studies of why this might occur, poor child feeding and weaning practices and poor compliance with iron supplementation. So there's a lot of um, implementation science in this. You can know what to do, but knowing how to get 
um, families to take up the intervention is another problem, as it is across the whole range of nutritional uh, problems, including obesity. So what's happening now is that we're seeing the effects of these lifestyle transitions, not only within countries, but within mother-child care. So there are examples of households with an underweight member and an overweight or obese member. And these are the numbers, China, Brazil, and Russia. And these, these pairs are often an underweight child and an overweight non-elderly adult, an overweight parent. And you can see how high these numbers are. And so this is fascinating to me. How can you have this scenario where in the same house I have an underweight child and an obese, uh, an obese adult? And what would I do about it? Um, in rural Indonesia, uh, you also see this double burden. It's called the maternal child double burden. Um, and in rural Bangladesh, the same thing. Why? What predicts this maternal child double burden? Well, maternal short stature and older age. Um, higher maternal education was protective of this double burden of obese mom, uh, underweight, undernourished child. Children who were older and later in the birth order and female will be more likely to be part of this mother-child care. And I don't know, I think these are just associations, so we don't know causality necessarily. Breastfeeding can be protective if the breast milk is good. If, if the breast milk is inadequate because of, if the mom was undernourished, it would be. And family characteristics, larger size, higher per capita household, were associated with maternal child burden. So it's intuitive and counterintuitive. More income, the adults are getting heavier. What's happening to the children um, in these households? So what about maternal short stature? Maternal short stature really reflects malnutrition. That's the previous generation, in early in the mother's life. Stunting alone in the mother, in addition to not including malnutrition or obesity, increases the risk of having a stunted child. And stunting is has an increased rate of obesity and chronic disease. So you see how complex this gets and how the history of one generation and one generation's nutrition carries on into the next generation. Why do we have stunting and obesity in the same child? Um, children who are stunted may have impaired fat oxidation capacity, which is a risk factor for obesity. The leptin receptors in the brain may be altered by stunting and increase the likelihood of obesity. And they need, they, um, you have that whole intrauterine programming. So we don't know why children have, the, we have this mixed pattern of under and over nutrition in the same child. So what's an adequate diet for children? We would all, I think this is a great definition, appropriate density of nutrients, sufficiently diverse, that it supplies adequate but not excessive amounts of nutrition, it's palatable and culturally acceptable, affordable and available year-round, and supports normal growth and development. I mean, that obviously is the goal. So the nutritional status of the infant does depend on the status of their mother. So poor maternal micronutrient nutrition during pregnancy contributes to iron deficiency. And mothers, on the same token, mothers with obesity are likely to give birth to premature and low birth weight babies at risk of the iron store. So we have micronutrient deficiencies occurring on both ends of the spectrum. Breast milk is such a wonderful thing, and, and we tend to be cavalier in this country, at least, thinking that all breast milk is good. And it is, except if you're a malnourished mom and you lack micronutrients. And there's also some emerging evidence that breast milk of a diabetic mom has different factors in it than normal weight mom and maybe predisposes the children a little more to diabetes. Certainly leptin is in breast milk, adnectin is in breast milk, and these growth factors are in breast milk. So all breast milk is not equal, and I think that in this country, we tend to think it is, but it's not. Um, low, leading in transition are critical, critical times when a child comes off breast milk or formula and goes into the normal adult diet. Low income countries, a third of the families were able to prepare proper food, but when they served it to the infants, they served it in uh, less amounts, and they were giving them fewer calories. So um, it's the opposite problem of obesity, where they're preparing food in large amounts and giving large amounts. These parents were giving lower than recommended amounts. And, and so not just not only giving them the food and giving them preparation skills, but they have to know how much to give the child. I think this is probably um, my most interesting slide to me. Dietary diversity, not only total calories, are important to foster appropriate growth and prevent stunting. 
So if you supplement kids with just calories, just carbohydrate or fat calories, they're undernourished, you don't, you don't prevent stunting. So the quality of nutrition is incredibly important. And energy supplements alone do not prevent stunting. This is sort of one of those cycles which can sort of there are touch points about all the burden of child undernutrition, starting with a low birth weight baby to a stunted child and adolescent to a woman who's malnourished in the cycle. And there's the same kind of cycle with obesity, where you have an obese mom giving, or a diabetic mom giving rise to a baby who is predisposed to obesity and diabetes, and uh, or if they're normal weight and if she delivers prematurely, which is a high risk of, they're low birth weight and they can So what, what we might think about doing, um, clearly preconceptual nutrition through the first at least two years of life is highly, highly critical here. We need to work hard to improve the weight and micronutrient status of mothers. Now this is easy to say and hard to do because if I think of my adolescent girls in clinic who are obese and I'm trying to improve their status, you know, at the very age you're trying to improve somebody's nutrition status is, is the hardest age to get some, an adolescent to pay attention to what they're eating, to take charge of their diet, to have those executive functions that don't hit until their 20s <laughs> and mid-20s. Um, just a point about obesity, there is some literature that would suggest that obesity itself has a cognitive impact. So there's some literature in adults and children that would suggest that the, the, the frontal lobe executive functioning is compromised in obesity, and we don't know if it's the chicken or the egg or what happens. But we do know that leptin receptors are in the brain. Leptin itself causes thin brain growth. Um, so we know that uh, we, we're beginning to think there's also a cognitive impairment around obesity. Surely promote breastfeeding. Um, we pay exquisite attention to the, to the content of early diets. And address physical activity on either end of the spectrum in mothers and, child, and children. But mothers are overburdened with a high physical activity when they're trying to, when they're pregnant and they're lactating and they're, and, and they're trying to care for young children, or they may be sedentary on the other end when they're, um, uh, and the children will therefore be sedentary when they're age. Um, strategies to improve micronutrient intake. Education is necessary but rarely sufficient because the implementation here is how you modify your diet, how you incorporate these foods into the culture and the food preparation, where you get the food. And um, we may need now um, a bundle. People are thinking of bundling interventions, which include micronutrients, complementary foods, treatment programs, and diarrhea diseases, and behavior change programs, and a bundled intervention to tackle this problem uh, at birth and before birth. I think we need to, to really um, build a consensus around approaches of how we're going to deal with malnutrition on both ends of the spectrum. I think we need to be thinking about how the obesity communities and the, and the undernutrition communities are going to converge. Um, you see this in politics. Uh, there's often the hunger in our country, there are often the, the folks, uh, the hunger people who are interested in malnutrition and hunger are often on the other side of the fence from the obesity people because our interventions are not integrated. This is a nutrition, a basic nutrition problem with people working at both ends of it, not integrating the efforts. So I think there's a call here for our efforts and see it as the nutritional problem that it is on both sides of the spectrum. And I'll just leave you with this because this is one of those wonderful complicated slides, but it, it sort of shows you that um, the importance of optimal fetal nutrition and development, um, what, what are the uh, markers for that, and then how we might do an integration step about assuring adequate and um, healthy nutrition for our mothers and children. So I'm going to leave you with that and leave that in. So, um, you mentioned early on, um, yeah, you mentioned that um, people don't cook. Yeah. When and why did we forget how to prepare meals? So, what happened to home ec? is one thing in this 
So when I was in school, I took home economics. There is no home economics. Home economics was moved to vocational technical school. It's now out of high schools that want to prepare kids for college. One tiny little basis. Um, the promotion of processed and convenience foods. So, you know, if you can put it in the microwave and have a dinner. The, the incredible stress that families are under where meal preparation time, if you say to a, a, a mother, you know, can you prepare that and it's 20 extra minutes, that's 20 extra minutes. It's not already dialed in. She doesn't have. We have parents coming home with hungry children. I mean, these are not these are not enormous problems. These are all the tiny little problems that conspire to having people that don't cook. So knowledge has gone by the wayside. Um, time. Children and parents. So children um, demand often these foods. And so I remember a mom, I was in clinic and she had a 13 and 14 year old and they were, they were obesity and we're talking about it. I said, so I asked a simple question, who decides on dinner? And she goes, well, they do. So what do you mean they do? She said, how do you do that? And the 13 year old decides and the 14 year old decides. So there's a stepping back of parents from their role. So often when I talk to parents, I say, your role as a parent is to provide healthy nutrition for your family. That's okay. That's like safety. You can do that because often they have stepped back from that role and they're letting, um, I had a mom who uh, was very proudly told me her two-year-old was operating the microwave. <laughs> uh, now, you know, you can see what that mom's thinking. She thinks, I have a great two-year-old. She can operate the microwave. You know, I have a five-year-old, uh, actually I have a twelve-year-old last week that was home mom, with a thirty-year-old brother, mom working at night. So mom works three to ten at night. They're home. And mom's trying very hard to ensure the nutrition, but she leaves the house at her home alone and then starts cooking. Honey and cheese or eating cereal, you know. So there are a lot of intervening factors, but I, I think not just the basic knowledge when you get these families together, just the basic knowledge of do you, do you know how to measure? Do you know how to portion? Do you know how to um, do something that isn't frying? They don't have it. So we, uh, we're, we're at a huge skill deficit. Right. Sorry, I go on. Are we seeing uh, uh, significant problems with mother child double burden? Not. Um, that's such a good question, and I, I actually wrote to Gary Foster, who's a researcher at Temple, but asked Gary to give any data on this because people haven't really been looking that carefully. There's one Head Start article that shows some short stature, and we've known for a long time in poverty stricken populations there's short stature, which we call short stature, probably is stunting. But I don't think we've looked carefully enough yet because this has been seen as the problem of the other. Um, but I think we probably do have it. I see it, and again, I, you know, this is so interesting. For years, I've been, I've been seeing the, the immigrant children come up from Mexico with shorter than expected heights. So if you have been overnourished say, with calories and you have open epiphysis, which means your bones can still grow, you're going to attain a height. You should be attaining a height at least the 90 percentile. Even you can push like beyond the genetic potential by overfeeding somebody if, if they can still grow. Why? So they go through puberty. And I've been seeing these immigrant children from Mexico come with heights under the 15th percentile. And I'll just say, oh, no, Sandy, they don't need the definition for short stature, but they're stunt. You know. So we have I, I think we have I think we would find if we would if we want. I don't think we have thought of that. Yeah, I think that's a good question. I'm sorry, this phenomenon in countries like India in populations that are chronically or historically undernourished, um, getting uh, enough food to get to what we consider normally but at normal weight exhibiting metabolic syndrome and diet. 
So you bring up a, such a good question. Um, the pocket, and, and you know, now that you've brought it up, we've known for a long time that Southeast Asian, at least South Asian population, have metabolic disease at much lower body mass indexes obesity, than other populations. And they carry more of their fat, even at normal weights, centrally. And what you're making me think of is that is that historical for them? Is there something that has happened to that population because they've had severe undernutrition and now they're in some kind of transition and you can't hit that normal point? Something's happening. You know, you just feed them enough and yet they're getting now this distribution of fat and metabolic disease. And I think um, I think that's such an excellent point. We don't know why, but if you are predisposed to obesity by genetics or heredity or whatever, and you merely shift your diet 150 calories a day. What you can't do is automatically just burn those calories as part of the predisposition. That's 15 pounds a year. So what you're saying is it's hard to thread that needle, right? As you're transitioning population, um, what is the metabolically healthy diet to have? And it does probably depend on what population you're talking about. And in a, I think the pediatricians I talked to from India are wrestling with this because now they have to screen at much lower weights for metabolic disease and they're getting type 2 diabetes at BMIs in the low 30s where we're getting them in the high 30s. So yeah, I, I don't think we know why, but it's clearly there. Okay. So what kind of impact is the food aid having in the global south? What's the predominant type of food that is being distributed through all the NGOs, yeah. and is there any take on the impact? So the thing that I know about, I don't know, is the refugee population. So there have been some refugee populations that I think, forget the name of them, they're in Sub-Saharan Africa, they've been refugees for a very long time, and they're dependent on food aid, and the food aid is coming in high carb, high fat, Low fructose, low fiber food aid, and they have epidemic obesity. They were nomadic. They left their country. They're now in refugee camps, and they're undergoing this transition very rapidly. So I think that's a, that's something that probably should be focused on. Are we giving the right kind of aid? You know, are we promoting the very things that we just we didn't want to promote by right? trying to think about it in calories alone? I mean, what are the most easily transportable calories? You know. Canned food, high energy dense sort of fat, protein food, right, cereals. So we, we may, I don't know that that's been dialed in. What is the match for that population? What food for that population would be the best food? What do you suspect? I suspect that we're not, we're doing exactly what we, we just said, we're giving them the easily transportable, high energy dense foods, which are cheap and give you calories, but not the um, thank you. Um, is there any um, movement between pediatricians and obstetricians to educate young uh, mothers who are about ready to produce so that they, from day one, start um, good nutrition with their children? Let me tell you one small thing. I, ride uh, public transportation down to uh, my studio. And on that, I see routinely mothers who um, give their two-year-old children obvious that the child is from the first learn how to do this properly putting two little fingers in and eating the frito very, very fast. And, and uh, this, is, this is across the board, that the children are eating um, fritos or candy bars on the way to whatever it is they're going to, to preschool or grocery school or daycare or something. So I would, there are so many aspects to that. One is cost. So a mother said to me, Dr. Kassin, the dollar value meal? That's not an option. That's a dollar where I can feed my kids. Now, is it good calories? No, but it's filling. Kids not going to say they're hungry. So cost is a huge driver. 
you know, the cost of that bag of Fritos, it doesn't spoil. It can be on the shelf for like 10 years, you know, nothing will happen to it. It's, it's relatively cheap compared to produce. It doesn't have to be cooked and prepared. It's portable. So um, we have a food supply cost issue. Um, again, we have that mother may not know how to prepare healthy food. She may live in an area where there's not easy access to healthy food. Um, education is necessary, but it's not going to be sufficient because I have a because this, this kind of thing is predominant in lower socioeconomic strata, but it's predominant. I see it across all economic strata. So people who know, knowing and doing, um, the drivers to, to feeding the children this kind of food are very high. And we're not helping with school food and daycare food, I will tell you. I mean, we're trying very hard to get healthy daycare food and healthy school food. But, it, but um, again, it's a cost issue. Government surplus cost. You know, so I, I completely agree with you. And getting into this population, um, the obstetricians are trying. They have new guidelines where they're actually have guidelines about the amount of weight you can gain in pregnancy because there was um, there was a movement for a while that it didn't really matter how much weight you gain. It turns out it matters a great deal. If you gain a lot of weight, you're an obese mom. Your your environment is changing. You perpetuate. How they're implementing that is not very good. The guidelines, but we don't have the right. How frustrating is it to you and your peers dealing with problems where most of the variables have to do in the private sector and lifestyles and things that are outside of the pharmacological responses that you can actually address? So, you know, people have been asking me that for 26 years. You know, how can you do with this? Um, the, the answer for my personal answer these are children and I'm not going to let any child be unborn. To. The frustration is you cannot beat this with individual um, willpower. So I, the, the, we are trying to talk to food companies and the producers of food and food policy. This is like the tobacco wars, only I think a little bit worse. Um, they, uh, they, are, they, um, they will follow the markets, and if there's as long as there's demand, and I, you know, I just read. Campbell's Soup had tried a healthier line of soup. It wasn't selling. You're going back. You know, McDonald's has tried. When McDonald's put in their salads, the, 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 the line, the economic return on investment of that was very high, but the hamburgers and french fries beat that because you got them in the store. So this is, um, it just adds fuel to the advocacy fire. I mean, at some point, we're going to have to think um, about the impact. And uh, the consumer, I'll just add this before I go on. In every other childhood disease, you have a consumer group. You have the Juvenile Diabetes Foundation. You have the Arthritis Foundation. You have the cancer folks. There's no advocacy group for these people. No parent advocacy group. I'm not sure why. But without that kind of population level advocacy, it's very hard because um, companies are like legislators. They respond to mass numbers. You know, a whole bunch of people start doing something, they start taking notice. So, uh, but the lack of our ability to get population of advocacy on this is a real heavy. Well, unfortunately, you're saying that brings up something that is different than what I wanted to ask you. But it's like I heard the talk on liquids and all the people that are drinking water. And I think that's a good example of bottled water, of like pet rocks, good advertising. and. Food companies are going to advertise what they can make the most money on. So, but my question is, has to do with the future. Now we're we're changing our insurance, medical insurance. Do you see that as being able to help change this, or are you optimistic? There's two things that, that make me hopeful. One is that all preventive care for children, based on the Bright Futures guidelines, was rolled into the Affordable Care Act with no copay on the so we can now deliver preventive care, and we have tried very hard to roll in nutrition and physical activity counseling into that. And the other is, and I'm not sure how this is going to play out, the focus on population health. So for the first time in a while, um, there, there will probably be rewards for managing a whole population of people's health optimally. Um, so the unfortunate part of that is the focus right now is on adult chronic illness, because that's where all the cost is, and that's the biggest ROI. 
and the, the children, um, when you're trying to do something for children who are not yet diseased, but you need to help them, children have a hard time staying on that table. So I think there's some pluses and minuses. I think that the, the win will be if we truly understand what it means to focus on population health and what that means longitudinally and you have to start early. And, um, uh, and we get away from this quarterly mentality of just wanting to focus, not that adults aren't important, but focus on adult chronic illness as, and, and the, as the sole uh, thing that we're trying to, to, to optimize. Um, with, with, the, with the tobacco wars, there were lawsuits. Uh, can anything like that be improved for some of the things you're talking about? So far, not. Um, I think people are toying with it. They're toying with taxes. And you've heard about the soda tax. And so the last experience, the soda tax that was had, um, as soon as somebody starts talking about the soda tax, the food and beverage industry comes in and tries to fund massive programs in that area. So an old tobacco warrior told me, as soon as you're getting close to key policies that the industry is afraid of, they come in with huge amounts of money to try to fund the program. Because policy will be the right policy. So, you know, yes, um, should we really be considering a soda tax? I think we should. Have we been successful? No, because the lobby is so incredibly strong. Thank you for your wonderful talk. Mm -hmm. um, we have I want to ask about all those data that you showed from uh, all over the rest of the world, the rest of the planet, and ask several things about those data. I did notice the absence uh, in South Africa. In fact, I yes. remarked upon it uh, because I know how prevalent diabetes is uh, in South Africa. Not reported. Not reported. <laughs> and uh, so the question, um, yeah, not reported because it just makes the country look so bad. And that's also been the case, for example, in Germany and some of the other countries. But what do you find in terms of the doctors, in terms of the researchers, and particularly in terms of the policymakers, um, as we start to find these data, and we do everything in worldwide uh, comparisons, especially in Asia, especially South Asia and Africa, at least just in Cambodia. And, um, you know, uh, with all the food that is being produced, it's stunting is a huge issue, and child feeding is a huge issue. There's, we're seeing all the maize, and we're seeing all the rice, and it's all being grown, but they're not giving that to children, and the mothers are stunted, the children are stunted. USAID has a new project to try to do that. So, um, I can speak to what we've done here now. As part of the Academy of Pediatrics, we actually have an office in Washington, D.C., and we lobby very hard on children's issues. And we're watching this all the time. And we, the, the pediatricians in this country, produce health guidelines, do a lot of state level advocacy. We are very geared up to do that. When you travel to other countries, the pediatricians are nowhere near, nowhere near this kind of advocacy effort. And what's been successful in this country, and it's not been necessarily about nutrition, but you know, seatbelt laws, hot water heater temperatures, all kinds of uh, legislation that, that we have participated in as health communities and parent advocacy groups. So when we think about this, we are we are having to export advocacy. You know, we have to export the advocacy because you can't do it there from here. That you can't do all of that. You have to have advocacy. And so we actually teach advocacy to the United States pediatricians. We are always talking about advocacy because that and building advocacy and building coalitions is the way you, you manage this change. But you're going to have to export the advocacy. Thank you for raising this very important issue. Um, oh, sorry. I just wanted to ask, um, you talked about uh, the importance of a varied diet yep. and varied nutrition. And obviously, I'm thinking you're, you're thinking I mean, they're plant-based nutrition, not just water, yeah. yeah. bag one yeah. night and chicken yeah. nights, yeah. the next yeah. night, that's not yeah. really right. right. Um, and I know there's a lot of programs, uh, like farmers markets that are doubling, like SNAP program, you can double your dollars, that sort of thing, or like, uh, school garden programs, and those kinds of things. Do you have any data or, or information about if that's affecting, how that's affecting the childhood obesity? There's this small effect on uptake, but now we need to talk about competitive food. So if you have fast food, convenience foods, highly palatable foods, and many of you probably read the New York Times article, I guess, several months ago about food engineering or taste, 
Okay? So in the, maybe it was the army back in Vietnam, the, the guys were not eating their MREs. They had to eat calories. They tasted like they didn't taste well. The guys weren't eating them. They started engineering the food to taste better so the army would eat the amount of calories they needed. And what the food industry bought into, figured out, is food engineering for palatability was a way to increase consumption. So there is actually a point that food is actually called the bliss point where they they have the, the taste that will keep you eating the food. Now I will tell you that when you have competitive foods in the home, snack foods, you go out to fast food and healthy food, the food of preference is going to be the competitive food. Okay? It's, it, it has the palatability, hard to eat a natural diet and have it taste good against that food. Um, so there are lots of you can increase access, but we have this competitive situation with highly palatable, semi maybe addictive foods, right, that are cheap against the natural diet. And I think that's a problem that has to be addressed. Because you can offer it but they but if demand is not there and demand is fueled by taste, and taste may be the biggest driver of eating right now. Vision portion size is a huge driver, but taste is probably one of the bigger drivers of consumption. And if you <coughs> producer, what do you want? You want Thank you so much for enlightening us. I remember in August about six years ago, we had a fellow that had worked uh, throughout the third world, uh, from Johns Hopkins, if I remember correctly. And he told us that the two best things that we could be pushing for to save lives would be more education for women and girls in the villages and good sanitation facilities, clean drinking potable water. And I want you what's the impact between childhood uh, from bad sanitation with obesity and, uh, and nutrition? Well, I think anytime you have the diarrheal diseases and undernutrition, you're going to have morbidity and mortality, and that's clear. Um, so I think that there's no question that you know eradication of infectious diseases is important to, to infant and child mortality. I think education of women and children but maybe beyond education, you know, again, they can know that they have to have access to skills. Um, if you, the mothers are the purveyors of nutrition in the household, that, I mean, in any culture I can think of, I'm looking at so, the mothers are the purveyors of nutrition. And if we cannot get to the women and, and get to the women with what they need in terms of decision making capability and resources, we're not going to fix this problem. So it's, it, it is a gender issue. Of the I was wondering if you had any comment about the addition of caffeine to drinks, such that the, in order to maintain your uh, addiction to caffeine, you need enough of empty calories of the soda. And they're uh, fundraising in schools and other things where they put basically empty calories and take the sugar into caffeine. Yeah, and I think caffeine and, and stimulants are a whole other topic we could talk about. Probably the biggest safety issue in the energy drinks is in young adults who drink and drink alcohol and also drink the energy drinks and then they get alcohol overdosing. I, I think that we have totally lost our way in terms of the quality of, well, we've totally lost our way in terms of thinking of food as a health issue and, that, and the health impact. And I, when I say to parents, this is about health, this is about the health impact, everything you put in your mouth determines your health, the light bulb goes on sometimes. I think the culture, our culture, at least, has totally lost its way in terms of what the basic meaning of nutrition to health. And we're looking at it as taste, palatability, social trending, marketing, acceptability, everything but health. So my question is, is the gender question, because this whole discussion has been about women and children, and I recognize that um, that's when you have short resources, you put them where they're most effective, but you also said that the biggest problems are in places like Pakistan and Bangladesh, where women have very little control over their lives. And so why do we keep saying it's a women's issue? I mean, why, why aren't there, why isn't this a men's issue too? Are there efforts to get the men on board in this problem too, or is it fully the mother's responsibility? Well, I think it's a 
I think it's, I, when I say a women's issue, I don't mean your responsibility. It's a cultural responsibility in terms of survival in the next generation without disease. So the culture as a whole has to ignite on the issue. I think there, and I would say that the women's problems with this are not just in the third world, but in this world. Because if you look at our inner city, you know, it's not just similar to how you teach nutrition to an inner city mom and how you teach nutrition to a mom in the country. So I think it's a global cultural problem of survival and health. I think the gender aspects of it are that women are put in charge, like in all highly stress situations, great responsibility, no resources to deal with the problem. And that has to be this has been an amazing tour de force in terms of your willingness to take this incredible series of questions and on each one of them with respect and, and insight and, uh, and understanding. So I'm, I'm deeply appreciative for all of us for your willingness to come here, address us, and light a spark, if you will, under everybody here about the complexities of these problems and how we're going to have to build ways, new relationships even, to, to tackle them. Because if we're here for solutions, we've just been in, in, exposed to an enormous number of issues that need to be addressed. And it's extremely important we take the what is from your identification of these problems. And now we have to take the next step to begin to integrate this into an understanding that where we can make a difference, where is it? Where is the expertise of this of this community of uh, in various new intellectual capacities, with lots of experience in the in the spiritual world and connecting the spiritual world with the scientific world? How can this now be utilized? This, this, Dollars that we just received, how can we make that bridge start to occur? So you have a lot of ideas, and I hope that you have, you've made an amazing uh, dent on our problem, so to speak, in terms of being able to give us the kinds of knowledge and information that we need. It. So I, I, on behalf of everyone, I want to thank you very much for the challenging presentation. Thank you. We're talking as we were stopping, and uh, we're saying, should we, should we have the usual break in the middle of what I said? No, let's have, there's so much interest in what you're talking about. Let's go on and let people really have a, a share the insights and the questions uh, across. And so we'll have the break now, but then we'll turn into an informal discussion. And I'm hoping that all of the people here will have a chance to think about it and talk to one another and, and keep them moving ahead with the last time. So it's 8.15 now. We've got a very good, rich session. Uh, please partake with some drinks and uh, no sweet drinks. No sweet drinks. Um, uh, water would be great. Uh, but all kidding aside, I, I do want to thank you again for coming by and being with us and continue to be with us because this is just the beginning. I hope by Thursday night, we'll have another set of answers that uh, Bill Clark came up to ask you, and, and you'll see another perspective on this, which is dramatic and interesting and important in how we're going to, how we're going to deal with these issues in the United States in this case. Thank you again. Do you have any announcements that you want to make? Yeah. I don't know if it's so. Then, what do you guys think? I'm going to do it. I just have a few notices, but I don't want to stop you. I don't want to drift towards the question. So, do please off to your way over there. And there's nothing that requires you to look at me and have to listen to me. So, please go on my Yeah. Yeah, I just want to confirm that Chapel tonight is in the Gullen Land. There's still been some uh, confusion about whether that's the case or not. But it definitely is in the Gullen Land.
This is about the light, it wasn't that I didn't get to the city and people from the testaments. Okay, I think what I'll do is I'm going to give these notices from people who've got their drinks and sat down here because I think I'm going to hide into nothing here. Did you get a background? Alright, so what is which video is it? Okay, so I'll see you in the